AI is a powerful tool. This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Yes, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the new AI for Good Discovery Series. Um, it's our series AI for Earth and Sustainability Science that is actually uh, created um, by a collaboration within the ALICE Network, the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems. Um, on the one hand, the, our, our program in Alice of Machine Learning for Earth and Climate Science, and on the other hand, the Alice unit here in Jena, where I'm also currently, and we um, co-curate that um, with Maria Piles from Valencia, Gustav Komsvais from Valencia, and Joachim Denzler, University of Jena. And myself, I'm Markus Reichstein, director at the Max Planck Institute, for biogeochemistry in Jena and also um, co-leading the Alice unit in Jena and as well um, the program that I just mentioned together with Gustav in this case. So we uh, have this series um, really to bring together a broad picture and, um, on, on the Earth system and AI for understanding the Earth system, but also for finding solutions with respect to sustainability. Um, and we are kicking off with a very nice uh, presentation, I believe, from Ricardo Buenuesa. Um, just quickly, um, he is Associate Professor at the Department of Engineering Mechanics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He's also Vice Director of the KTH Digitalization Platform and leading uh, the Climate Action Center there. Uh, so he has a, a strong expertise actually in using machine learning and, and modeling numerical simulations for um, fluid dynamics, uh, in particular in complicated or complex situations like uh, um, in urban uh, settings, but also for, for airplanes, for example. So he has a lot of experience there, but also uh, has a lot of uh, thoughts put into how actually AI can contribute to improving our pathway towards the sustainable development goals. So I'm really looking forward um, to this presentation um, by, by Ricardo, and uh, we will have uh, then also possibility to 
um, discuss in more detail after the series uh, and uh, network also. So I'm really looking forward. And uh, thanks, Ricardo, for being available. Hi, can you hear me well? Very well. Great. Uh, and you can see my slides also, right? <clears throat> Great. Yes, well, perfect. it's uh, uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be part of this um, of this uh, great uh, lecture series. I think it's a very necessary initiative. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the role of artificial intelligence uh, in achieving um, the sustainable development goals. Um, this is work uh, funded, uh, among others, by the by the ERC. Uh, and also Digital Futures, which is a big initiative in Sweden, uh, which has allowed us to expand many of the uh, many of the areas that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Okay. So, as I was mentioned in the introduction, my main uh, my main area of, of research is on using machine learning and large scale computers to study fluid mechanics, to study complex problems that are related with uh, cities, airplanes. Uh, and in this presentation, I first want to uh, start by, by talking a little bit about our work on AI for sustainability, so how we really build uh, an international group uh, and a big uh, consortium to really um, tackle uh, some of these open questions and some of these challenges. And in the second part of the presentation, uh, I will be a bit more technical from the uh, machine learning point of view, how we can actually solve some of these problems. No? So we will try to, uh, and I will try to make it not too technical so that uh, it can be accessible for the, for the audience uh, and that we can try to adapt also in the discussion if there are any, any open questions. So let's start with how to use AI for uh, sustainability. Uh, and here, I would like to start by uh, talking a little bit about machine learning and what machine learning can do. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, there has been a, a big in improvement in the capabilities of machine learning. For example, in image recognition, uh, you can look at the ImageNet challenge where uh, humans make 5% uh, error when classifying images and the machines are only making only 2% error. Um, there's many areas where machine learning is getting progressively better, such as finances, speech recognition, large-scale data analytics. Uh, one, one example, uh, already in 1997, was the game of chess, where uh, Gary Kasparov uh, lost against the IBM Deep Blue machine. You can see here how the media at the time uh, took it as a, as a quite big uh, accomplishment. Uh, Gary Kasparov didn't take it so well. There was quite some controversy afterwards. Uh, it turns out that uh, chess is a quite easy game to play for machine learning because the number of moves and the number of possibilities is rather limited. And almost with brute force computing, uh, one can actually play chess quite, uh, quite well. <laughs> now, why are games being used to uh, assess the performance of machine learning? Uh, well, games constitute quite complex but narrow challenges. And in the path of achieving a machine or an algorithm that is able to solve complex tasks um, in a way similar to, to, to the human uh, thinking, uh, well, this, this type of games are actually helping to assess the performance uh, in many of these situations. Uh, of course, they are very narrow. So uh, and now part of the research um, of DeepMind, for example, is going into expanding the, the generalizability of these networks. So they can do pretty well, not only in one game, but in several games. Uh, but perhaps one big landmark that was achieved uh, was when uh, tackling the game of Go. Okay, the game of Go, which you can see here at the bottom, uh, it was popularized by DeepMind. <laughs> and one can, um, it's a very complex game. So one can define the complexity of a game by taking the number of possible moves in one turn and raising this number to the number of turns of a typical game. Uh, and in the case of Go, uh, this, uh, this metric is you know, many, many orders of magnitude uh, higher than that of chess. So Go, Go is a very, very complex game and that cannot be played using brute force computing. <laughs> one needs a certain level of intuition to choose the best moves to, to take. And that's why Go was not considered um, I mean, it was not really thought that it would be tackled by machine learning uh, until many decades into the future, but it turns out that, that it did. Um, using reinforcement learning, uh, they basically showed an algorithm, uh, the best uh, games of the best human players of Go, and the, the DeepMind team uh, published the algorithm AlphaGo, which defeated the world champion Lee Sedol by four against one, which was already a quite remarkable achievement. <laughs> but even more remarkable, 
was the year after when they um, trained the algorithm AlphaGo Zero, <laughs> in which they did not show any human games at all. They just gave the algorithm the rules of the game of Go and let it play against itself to be able to well to to improve uh, in a in a kind of uh, in a reinforcement learning way. Uh, and here on the right, you can see the performance of this algorithm as a function of training time. In less than two days, uh, the reinforcement learning uh, based uh, algorithm achieved superhuman performance. So it was actually able to defeat the AlphaGo machine by a, by 100 against zero. So this is really, <laughs> and really finding strategies that were very, very unexpected. Something that uh, people were not really, um, well, were not really understanding until later into the game, no? what those strategies were actually doing. <laughs> so there's quite some massive potential for machine learning in many, many applications. And uh, well, in this context, we thought that there, it would be interesting to see how machine learning can actually help for the sustainable development goals. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in the audience is familiar with them. This is basically the 2030 agenda uh, of the United Nations for a sustainable future. And it's a shared uh, blueprint for uh, peace and prosperity, uh, where it's actually quite important to highlight that the SDGs span a very wide range of areas, no? from ending poverty to economic growth to uh, environmental um, concern and uh, awareness. Okay? <laughs> As everybody here knows, uh, there are a to total of 17 SDGs, which are the bigger goals. And then within these SDGs, there are sub goals which are called targets, and we have a total of 169 targets in the SDG agenda. So, quite some years ago, uh, we were asking uh, ourselves the question uh, of whether uh, there is published evidence of AI acting as an enabler or an inhibitor of each of the 169 targets. <laughs> and this question we asked it ourselves. Uh, uh, in 2018 already, that's when we started to think about these things. So now, now five years ago, um, and we didn't find any evidence at the time. So we thought that we had to really answer this question, really tackle this challenge. <clears throat> and because of the wide range of areas that are spanned by the SDGs, we really need to assemble a multidisciplinary team uh, with all the different areas of knowledge and all the different disciplines that are uh, required to really tackle this question. And this uh, uh, turned out to be an article that received quite some attention. The reference is here at the bottom, the US and others. Uh, this was published in Nature Communications uh, in 2020. And this has uh, become a quite, um, a quite uh, influential article that has led to several spin-offs that I will be also mentioning today. So in this team, uh, we assemble uh, well a quite range, uh, quite wide range areas of disciplines. Um, we have five men and five women from all over the world. Uh, we have experts in machine learning, in theoretical and applied machine learning, social interaction, interaction design, AI ethics, uh, biodiversity and ecology, uh, economy and law, uh, cosmology. Uh, we have Max Tiekmark. Uh, from MIT, and also sustainability energy, energy systems. So we really compile a very broad range of areas in our team. <laughs> and we divided the 17 SDGs into three categories, the society, the economy, and the environment, as you can see in this figure. This is a reasonably uh, standard um, classification. Eh? So this is uh, allowing us to look at the effects of the SDGs in a quite holistic way. <laughs> and this is the process that we followed. We did what is based, uh, what is called a consensus-based uh, expert elic elicitation. And so essentially, we had uh, experts reading the literature um, and trying to debate on the merits of the various uh, areas of knowledge. <laughs> what we did was to take e each SDG and assign a couple of experts. So in these particular examples, uh, we had um, Sami and Simone. Um, these experts had to go target by target of that SDG and then report whether AI can act as an enabler, an inhibitor, or both or known. Uh, we had a quite long reasoning for each of these targets and a quite complete list of references. <laughs> so this, um, this was first made by the experts. And then we also added a couple of reviewers. So in this case, we had uh, Yolanda and myself as reviewers. Uh, and our job, uh, we would have um, 
areas of competence that were complementary with those of the experts. Uh, and our job was to poke holes on their argumentation uh, to try to really, uh, well, bring a debate and a, and a discussion until we would converge on our view uh, regarding the impact of AI on those particular targets of that SCD. Now, this is a very complete database. Um, so this, uh, this file with all the references, all the targets that's available in the supplementary material of the Nature Communications paper. So everything is there. You can check for uh, more details and references that uh, article. What I will be doing today is talk about the general, the big picture and the general conclusions that we can obtain from our study. <laughs> so um, if we look at the three main areas, what we see is that AI has mostly a positive effect. So 79% of the targets can be positively affected by AI, whereas 35% of the targets can be negatively affected by AI. However, even if there is a more positive than negative effects, we should not forget that even one target being negatively affected can have catastrophic consequences. So we should really be uh, aware of the negatives and pay sufficient attention to those uh, challenges uh, that AI can raise. The area that has more potential is the environment, uh, and the area which could be perhaps more challenging is the society with the most uh, negative impact, as you can see in this uh, figure the, uh, over here. Okay. What I'm showing you now <laughs> is a description uh, for all the SDGs. On the left, I'm showing you the positive effects of AI per SDG and on the right, the negative effects of AI for each of the SDGs. So <laughs> in each SDG, the number indicates the percentage of targets being positively or negatively affected by uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> and what you can see here is that I'm showing you two lines, the darker color and the lighter color. The lighter color is obtained when at least one reference uh, documents a positive or a negative effect. Okay? Uh, however, uh, not all the references are the same. <laughs> what we also did was to make a classification on the quality of the references, or let's say the strength of the evidence of the references, by classifying all the references into four categories, ranging from A to D category, where the A references are the ones with the strongest evidence, the ones that are hardest to generalize, and the D references at the bottom uh, these are the more speculative and less uh, easy to generalize um, studies. <laughs> we also have weighting factors going from 1 to 0.25, where, for example, a C type of reference would only count as half of a target being positively or negatively affected. Um, this actually gives us <laughs> the dark colors that we see in these figures. So obviously the uh, dark area is smaller or equal than the light area because the weighting factors go from 0.25 to 1. And what is interesting is to see the decrease between the light and the dark regions. So what we can actually see is that um, there is a significant, um, there is actually a quite significant uh, decrease uh, when we are actually looking at the uh, negatives in the environment and the society. So the negative effects of AI in the environment and the society are perhaps more speculative yeah, because the reduction, when I take the strength of the evidence, is quite pronounced, um, and this constitute research gaps. And in the positives, <laughs> what is interesting is that the economy has, um, well, quite some uh, speculative uh, references as well. The, the research gaps are the negative effects of AI on the environment and the society, and the positive effects of AI on the economy. So that's actually an area which requires further investigation uh, to really uh, assess the full potential uh, of artificial intelligence in the context of the economy. Okay. So some key results, some general trends. <laughs> Generally, AI is um, allowing to achieve certain uh, SDGs by enabling new technology that was not possible before. <laughs> so for example, in the context of SDG 1 on no poverty, uh, by using satellite data and using convolutional neural networks to analyze this, uh, this satellite data, it's possible to uh, achieve more uh, effectively and faster SDG 1. <laughs> the biggest shortcomings of, um, of AI 
uh, have to do with increasing inequalities. So if the future is going to rely on AI and not everybody has the same sort of access to AI technologies, we're going to exacerbate the, the existing inequalities and have a very negative effect on SDG. So SDG 10 on reducing inequalities is a key aspect uh, when analyzing the negative effects of artificial intelligence for the achievement of the UN agenda. Another very important area has to do with SDG 5 on gender equality. <laughs> and there are two types of um, gender uh, challenges that, I, that we can identify in our research through AI. The first one is the gender, in the, the gender gap uh, in the data because the data that is being used to train many of these algorithms, like medical algorithms, uh, is also biased towards men. And second, the uh, gap in the workforce, because the, the professionals that are developing these algorithms are uh, inducing some biases uh, by their views and, and by their perspective in the design of the algorithms themselves. Uh, and here there is another ga uh, gap because uh, the, the workforce is massively dominated by men. So uh, both, research, uh, both gaps in the uh, workforce and in the data need to be tackled to be able to, uh, well, to obtain the best potential of artificial intelligence in the context of uh, SDG5. Uh, okay. Now, more things. Um, this, uh, by the way, this is uh, discussed in the Nature Communications paper, but also there is this other article, uh, Gupta and others, where um, what we did was to have a workshop in Stockholm where we discussed uh, the, basically the, the new directions of our Nature Communications paper, and those discussions are summarized in this article in Transportation Engineering. Okay? So here we also have additional uh, considerations of this um, of this article that we are seeing here. Okay. So let's look at some uh, particular examples. Uh, AI is really helping uh, with um, SDG seven on clean energy, with SDG thirteen on climate action. Basically, all the targets can be positively affected. However. Uh, the usage of AI has a huge uh, environmental impact itself. Um, at the moment, the consumption of AI, well, of ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, is around 1% of the total electricity worldwide. But by 2030, this is expected to increase to 20% of the total. So um, we should also consider not only AI for sustainability, but mm, how sustainable is AI itself. And for that, we should leverage what we know about the data. So we should embed as much physics as we can in our data uh, and also use transfer learning and effective ways of training and interpreting deep learning models so that we can uh, ensure that AI itself is sustainable. <clears throat> Other risks um, from the perspective of uh, political polarization, biases. Uh, of course, we have experienced this in the context of the corona emergency, of the um, war in Ukraine, and also of the climate crisis, AI is introducing uh, division and uh, political polarization through social media, through algorithms that are sorting the data that we can see. And this is something that has a tremendous impact on SDG 10. Also on SDG 16, on um, strong institutions. And that is why we argue in our article that uh, regulatory oversight is important, but it's even more important regulatory insight. So the people who are making the regulations, and this is uh, relevant in the context of the AI Act, um, they need to be uh, advised by, by experts. I mean, if, if people who know what AI can and cannot do, uh, otherwise any regulation that you develop based on these uh, aspects uh, is going to be counterproductive. So we need to embed the knowledge and get a realistic view on the potential of AI technologies. <clears throat> Talking about crisis, uh, in the corona crisis, uh, we looked a lot at uh, digital contact tracing uh, applications and methods. Okay? So digital contact tracing apps <laughs> had or would have had a tremendous impact on SDG 13, on, uh, sorry, SDG 3 on health, but also SDG 10 on inequalities no? because of the um, ethical challenges that could be associated with, this, uh, with these apps. <laughs> to be um, honest, uh, I really think that um, there could have been much more benefit from these apps if they had had more penetration in the society. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I believe that the communication strategies from the governments were not adequate. Um, of course, the, there were challenges with these apps in terms of data gathering and what we claim at the time, uh, there is this article in Resource in Engineering uh, in 2020, 
<coughs> is that um, we have to avoid centralized data gathering. And that's why the DP3T protocol, uh, which allowed the centralized data gathering, was an excellent approach for this. Uh, and what we did at the time also was to establish a socio-technical framework to judge and evaluate these apps. So uh, in this framework, we had three, a total of 19 categories, which were divided into <laughs> impact on the citizens, technology, and governance. So basically, uh, we evaluated three different apps, Stop Corona, the uh, UK app, and the Trace Together in Singapore. The UK app uh, initially was centralized, we really uh, showed that this was really not uh, acceptable and it was changed later on. So eventually it became uh, decentralized. Um, many of these apps had problems with uh, governance, uh, with uh, not only with the technology, but also with the way that they were deployed and with the communication and transparency strategy. In fact, the European Data Protection Board guidelines, which we also evaluated as the fourth panel, uh, even the EU guidelines did not comply with our criteria. That was not uh, strict enough for what we thought should have been uh, an adequate framework for uh, digital contact tracing. <laughs> so you can see all the criteria and all the analysis that we did in this reference. And this is probably a good example, uh, a good training, uh, because the future is gonna rely more and more on, on apps no? that are gonna be taking data from us, they're gonna be sharing and gathering data. And therefore we should be very concerned uh, and we should be following the socio-technical restrictions and guidelines that we established in this in this article okay because so at the same time there is great possible benefit in all these technologies we just need to have an adequate deployment and an adequate communication from the governments so all these interactions <coughs> can be summarized in this figure where the uh, thickness of the arrows indicates the speed of change the technology is uh, advancing uh, very fast, much faster than the individuals. The individuals are lagging behind. And of course, the governments, which interact with the other agents in terms of standards and regulations, they, they have the thinnest arrows. They are really, really slow. No? They're really not reacting fast enough. And all of these interactions are happening with the environment as an underlying layer in terms of positive and negative impacts, but also of resources. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, we need to be aware of all these interactions so that we can uh, exploit um, this potential, we can leverage all the potential of AI to the maximum while respecting the environmental constraints and also the, um, all these uh, agents that take place in, the, in, this, uh, in this interaction, okay? Now, uh, I want to focus on one particular application. And again, I will not get too technical, but I will at least try to show some, some particular and concrete examples. This is the case of SDG 11 on sustainable cities and also connected with SDG 13 on climate action. Um, so in SDG 11, uh, we saw that all the targets can be positively affected by AI. <laughs> and uh, this actually motivated some of my fluid mechanics work because we realized that um, the pollution levels in cities cause 800,000 deaths only in Europe every year. So clearly there is a very, very high potential of improvement uh, and an AI can be used to measure and, and predict and also uh, control the pollution levels in cities. No? So this is an area where there can be massive potential. <laughs> so um, essentially, and this is a little bit of, of a technical uh, application, one can use numerical simulations, this would be the, the flow around a building, um, to combine uh, numerical data with deep learning methods so that you can take sparse measurements like these black dots over here <laughs> and through deep learning reconstruct the three-dimensional flow and the three-dimensional um, distributions of pollutant, of pollutant concentration of different levels of pollution. <laughs> These are very detailed flow simulations. You can find the references down here in La Pita and others and also Martina Sanchez and others. <laughs> the idea is that with very detailed flow uh, data, I can establish a mapping between the sparse measurements and the three-dimensional volume of flow and uh, pollution levels. And this is a bit of the flow chart that one can follow for these estimations. Uh, you can really see the very high level of detail that we can obtain in our simulations. These are uh, obstacles that represent uh, building blocks of a city uh, and being able to generalize to progressively more and more complicated geometries is actually something that can help us to establish these deep learning frameworks for prediction. In this context, I want to also highlight 
that uh, machine learning can help in these flow simulations uh, uh, to be able to have more sustainable and more uh, accurate representations of the, of the velocities and pollution levels in cities. There is a review paper that we have in Nature Computational Science where we look at the improvement of flow simulations with machine learning. And perhaps more importantly in this context, <laughs> there is the whole aspect of interpretability. Uh, of course, I'm bringing, going back to the example of no poverty and using satellite data uh, and convolutional neural networks to analyze the satellite data. <laughs> we can see the example at the bottom, how um, the images from the satellite are analyzed by the convolutional neural networks through filter activation maps, basically. So you can see which features of the data are being extracted to decide uh, basically the predicted consumption. So basically the amount of money of a particular region in a, in a period of time. No? <laughs> the problem is that this, uh, this method, which is not interpretable, uh, doesn't tell me why a particular region is classified as poor or in risk of poverty or not poor. <laughs> With um, interpretability, Okay, and there is uh, quite some work on inductive biases combined with symbolic regression. There is the work by Kramer and others. We have a, a paper in Nature Machine Intelligence where we also look at these aspects. Uh, we can obtain a symbolic equation which reproduces the predictive capabilities of a neural network, but uh, in an interpretable way. <laughs> so in this example, we could correlate the predicted consumption with aspects such as the night, um, the, the amount of light during the night of a particular region, the amount of roads, the amount of uh, kilometers uh, with respect to a bigger town. So all these aspects in this equation, they start to play a, a particular role. And now I don't have a black box that tells me this is poor, this is not poor. I know why. I know the parameters and the factors that come into that classification. And that's important to be able to establish international cooperation activities. But not only that, it's also important to understand the dynamics of how a particular region can get into poverty or not. What are the parameters that are changing over time? This is important for the SDGs. This is SDG 1. But an example that we talk a lot uh, in our uh, article is the SDG 3 on health. Because if a particular uh, algorithm is deciding that you have a particular diagnosis or not, and we don't know the reasoning, uh, that's highly problematic. So if we want to have a chance of achieving the SDGs with artificial intelligence, we need to make sure that this is done in an interpretable framework so we can basically open the black box. No? We can really have deep learning solutions that are interpretable for us. Okay. Now, I will dig a bit more into <clears throat> the predictions. So basically, uh, how we can use flow data and machine learning to predict the three-dimensional volumes of the flow velocities, of the pollutions, and all these quantities. Yeah? Uh, I will not uh, get too technical, but of course, you can ask me if you have any questions. Um, essentially, what we are doing is that we are considering a channel. So we're considering a surface where the flow is flowing above. And we want to use measurements at the wall to predict what happens above the wall, not to predict what happens in this region over here. A little bit going back to what we had in the city where we had these measurements at the wall and we want to predict uh, what happens above. Uh, this is work by Luca Guastoni, a PhD student in my group. This is published in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. <laughs> all, the, um, all the codes and all the data are available, open access. So you can reach out to us and we will make, you, make sure that you can have access to everything. We are using information, basically the wall shear stress at the wall to predict what happens with the flow above the wall. And to do that, we use convolutional neural networks. The convolutional neural networks are very good at exploiting spatial information in the flow, in the data, because the convolutional neural networks are uh, assessing patterns in the flow. Uh, here I'm showing you an architecture with six hidden layers and this number of filters per hidden layer. So you can get a bit more uh, information about this particular architecture. <laughs> the first layers are identifying uh, features which are simpler in the data, eh? so actually quite simpler uh, and smaller. And due to the concatenated application of convolutions, I am building towards more and more complicated features at the end of the network. So I'm hierarchically building more and more complex features. Uh, and that's actually allowing me to construct uh, in a hierarchical way flow extractors that are relevant to my predictions, not only for the velocity, but also for the, um, 
for the pollution levels. So convolution neural networks uh, are actually very widely used tools in computer vision because they can exploit the spatial information in the data, which of course is very relevant when you're trying to predict uh, flows in, in cities. Okay. Now, uh, convolutional neural networks can uh, be fully connected at the end, which means that that will give me a global output. For example, a classification of this image as a car, but you can also use fully convolutional networks, which will give me local outputs. In this image, I can find this is a car, this is the road, this is a pedestrian cross. And that's what we want to do because we want to have a very detailed image of the velocities and pollution levels in a particular region of the city. So we are using fully convolutional networks for this particular task. <laughs> this is what the architecture looks like. On the left, I'm showing you my inputs, which are measured at the wall. And on the right, I'm showing you my outputs, which are measured above the wall. Yeah, this is the flow velocity and the characteristics that I want to characterize in my urban environment. What I showed you so far is basically an architecture called FCN, fully convolutional network. Um, but we can actually use uh, something called proper orthogonal decomposition or PCA, principal component analysis, which will allow me to decompose the spatiotemporal problem into spatial information and temporal information. And in certain cases, these predictions are actually going to be more robust <laughs> without entering too much into the details. But here, what I'm showing you is a snapshot of the flow. The third row would be the reference. This is what I want to reconstruct. And the first row is a prediction from a linear method. Now, in fluid mechanics, when you have turbulence or when you have the flow in cities, uh, the behavior is mostly nonlinear. So if you use a linear method, you're actually missing a lot of the details of the flow. Uh, what we want to do, and you can see that in the prediction that these uh, flows are quite different from what you can actually get on the third row. What you want to do is to leverage the non-linearities that you have in, uh, in neural networks, and in particular in the convolutional architectures that we're using here. The fourth row is giving me the prediction with the FCN, which predicts really good um, results very close to the wall. And the FCM POD predicts very well when I'm moving farther away. Okay, so if I'm close to the wall, I want to use the FCN architecture. If I move farther away, then I will combine the convolutional network with the PCA or the POD uh, configurations. Okay, the performance, if you look at a statistical description, is really good. So close to the wall, I'm actually getting less than 1% error. So I can really, really predict the flow structures responsible for the pollution levels in cities with a very high accuracy. When I move farther away, the predictions get worse because the input and the output are less correlated. But still, I can actually get uh, really good predictions there. Uh, and something that I would like to expl uh, explain a bit more, this is something that I mentioned before when talking about the sustainability of AI itself, and this is basically transfer learning, okay? So in transfer learning, <laughs> I'm um, using information that I know in one case for another case that is not too similar nor too different from the origin. <clears throat> so if I uh, consider an architecture to um, predict close to the wall, I can transfer uh, the three first layers. So basically the ones that are identifying smaller and more abstract features to an architecture to predict farther away from the wall in a way that I only need to retrain the three, the three last layers, the ones that are identifying features that are more um, larger and more nuanced, no? more detailed. And doing things like this, what I can actually do is that I can reduce the um, amount of training time by a factor of four. So I can really, really improve the efficiency of training of my uh, architecture. This is also true when I look at uh, different Reynolds number conditions. So let's say less and more turbulent configurations. At the end, I can reduce the amount of um, training time by a factor of four. So again, this is something that we should be exploiting eh, when using our deep learning architectures, because uh, this way we can actually obtain a more robust, more reliable deep learning models, but also we should uh, make sure that we can obtain uh, a more sustainable approach. So embedding physics and transfer learning are key strategies 
to develop adequate uh, deep learning configurations. Okay. Um, one uh, technical note also, if my sensors that I mentioned before are uh, very sparsely distributed, they're very coarse, uh, one can actually use a different type of computer vision application called GAN, which is a generative adversarial network. So in GAN architectures, um, what you can do uh, is that you have two parts of the same network. The first architecture uh, is the generator. The generator is producing high resolution data from low resolution data based on uh, the reference information. And the second part is the discriminator. And the discriminator has the job <laughs> of uh, assessing whether a particular high resolution image is true or if it was produced by the generator. And of course, these parts of the network have antagonic roles uh, and they're trained together using game theory in such a way that the generator is very good at predicting uh, high resolution images that are very realistic. This can be uh, combined in our deep learning architecture that you can see here at the top right panel. So that we use first coarse information at the wall we do super resolution to obtain high resolution information at the wall. And then that information can be used to predict the flow and the pollutants above the wall. So this is a framework that allows me to go from very coarse information at the wall to very detailed information above. <laughs> this um, methodology is published in Physics of Fluids. You can see the reference here. Uh, here is the reference at the wall. Uh, the top row is showing me progressively more and more coarse information. So this top right panel is very, very coarse. And at the bottom, I'm showing you the reconstruction. So basically, what I'm showing you, if you compare the bottom panels with the reference, uh, the data looks very realistic. So these structures, these patterns, blue and red, they are as long as they should be. They have the right size, the right spacing and location. So long story short, <coughs> from very coarse information at the wall, I can actually have a, a very highly detailed reconstruction of the flow in urban environments and in airplanes, as mentioned before, in very different configurations. So these uh, GAN architectures for super resolution, I think they have a lot of promise to be able to tackle some of these sustainability challenges uh, in the context of urban environments. Okay. And before finishing, uh, I, we will have plenty of time for questions, but I want to spend some minutes with some reflections. Um, and first of all, we have um, shown that 79% of the targets can be uh, facilitated with the achievement of uh, AI, but 35% uh, of those uh, well, can be challenged, no? they can be inhibited by the development of AI. And this, in principle, gives us, it, it paints a quite optimistic picture, no? because if most of the targets can help, we should go full speed with AI, and we don't really care about the negatives. There are many nuances because the sustainable development goals are a comprehensive system where everything is interconnected and we can't just neglect the negatives. One particular negative um, target, uh, let's, let's say that we are trying to preserve the ecosystem in a particular area and at the same time we are destroying the ecosystem in a, uh, under the ocean in a, part, in a different area, uh, that can trigger a chain of effects that really has very negative uh, consequences in a wide range of SDGs. So, we should be careful with how we are um, assessing our um, our uh, impact of AI on the on, on all the SDGs. This is why uh, the the work that we did in Nature Communications it was based on experts, on experts talking with each other with different areas of expertise and different biases because we are humans. No, we have biases depending on the areas that we really want to focus on. <clears throat> One extension of that work. Uh, which we are currently starting and as funded by uh, Digital Futures and the KTH Climate Action Center, is to do um, a similar study automatically using large natural language um, processing, so NLP. So what we are doing now is that we are taking large databases of um, articles and research uh, papers, and we are uh, using AI, classifying them into um, the various SDGs, and trying to assess the positive and negative relationships among SDGs. Um, why do we do that? This is because um, there may be hidden positive and negative connections among SDGs that we are not able to uh, identify as, as human experts. No? By analyzing, instead of hundreds of papers, we can analyze tens of thousands of papers, and that's really helping 
to establish a more uh, unbiased, robust, and massive database of interactions among SDGs. <clears throat> With that information, what we want to do is to develop an algorithm to optimize policy decisions. So if we want to really benefit the impact on climate, then we should really focus on these uh, areas and avoid these other areas because of the unexpected and unintended negative consequences and interactions among SDGs. So this, I believe, is a very exciting area of research. We're using NLP um, large uh, transformer models combined also with deep reinforcement learning to be able to optimize the actions eh, in our uh, dynamic rate changing system. <clears throat> so we are uh, looking forward to reporting some of these um, results. Uh, we are already finding some biases in the funding, in the funding um, decisions, both in the EU and uh, in the US with artificial intelligence. Uh, and I really think that these tools will become more important uh, for uh, very relevant uh, policy decisions. Um, I also want to, well, I also talked about the possibilities in the context of um, SDG 11 and 13, eh, using deep learning, using computer vision. If you're interested in the in the technical details, uh, I can get back to you with more information. Uh, for now, this is my email and my lab, the Vinuesa lab. You can reach out and contact me anytime. This is also my social media. Uh, and in YouTube, we have quite some videos explaining our articles, our research directions, uh, some uh, uh, demonstrators as well of the typical directions that we are uh, doing. So I'm very happy to, um, yeah, to get in contact with you uh, to really discuss possible ideas and collaborations. Uh, and for now, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I believe that we have plenty of time for, for questions. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot for this very nice presentation with both a, a bigger picture and then some uh, very interesting details, uh, technical details, which uh, can be, of course, even more detailed. Uh, so we can have questions on, on both uh, on both parts and uh, the questions go through um, the chat and I, I will basically uh, moderate them. <laughs> Um, and I will just go uh, go through them more or less. Uh, we have already a, a couple of questions. I will see if I can interject my own question, but let me let's maybe first start with the chat. Um, so I mean, there was one question from Luz Rune. You uh, wanted to know about uh, or she? I'm not quite sure. If Luz is a female or male name. Um, anyway, the person wanted to know about an example uh, of a negative uh, effect uh, for an STG target. I think you mentioned some in the, in the talk, but maybe you want to elaborate a, a bit more. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, generally, um, many of these uh, negative effects were, of course, unintended negative consequences. I mean, there is not any uh, research uh, that is explicitly targeting uh, at not achieving an, a, an SDG or a target, uh, but there were many examples on uh, increased inequalities. So uh, in the context of the economy, if you're really auto gener generating a lot of automatic uh, processes and then not everybody can access the technology necessary to be able to be part of this new economy, you will exacerbate the inequalities. Uh, many effects also on the environment. You are uh, using AI to, uh, for example, have a nice match between supply and demand of electricity so that you can maximize the use of renewable energy. But of course, the energy that you use to power the AI models themselves also has a very negative impact on the environment. Um, of course, many examples uh, with, um, with uh, the SDGs related to the biosphere. No? Uh, so in many cases, uh, there were uh, applications with robots that were targeting at preserving a particular type of fish, and turns out that those robots were actually having negative impacts on a particular type of plant or a particular type of animal that relied on other fish to be able to stay you know, in balance. So you could really, really have big impacts on the ecosystem uh, if this um, uh, AI technology is not really deployed in a, well, in a balanced manner, let's say. And of course, many more examples in the supplementary material of the article, but it's all in that direction. You are trying to help something, but inadvertently you are affecting something else. Yes, thanks. Maybe because I had a, I had a similar uh, question um, or kind of related to that. I mean, isn't it at the end that uh, basic AI is a, is a tool like, like, like a hammer or so, and you can use it in that or that, this way? Um, and at the end, it depends a bit on the 
cost function basically that you that you put or on the on, on the on, on the objective that you put and uh, for example I have the, the example is coming out a little bit from biodiversity research and uh, resource management and ecosystems or forestry and so on that that usually there has been there has been always one can go with a goal function of maximizing productivity um, but this could actually lead to less resilience uh, of the system so at the end you have some trade-offs and at the end probably one has to have a kind of the, the goal itself uh, is very hard to define from AI, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, so I, I completely agree. Completely agree. That's why that motivated uh, the study that we are doing now on extending this work to do it automatically, no? to, really, mm -hmm. to really find those hidden connections. Uh, and in this context, uh, because of course you could have a, for a predictive task like the convolutional neural network that I showed, no, you could add in your loss function as many terms as you want. No, you can start to, uh, and that's maybe not the most reasonable uh, choice. You can start to say, okay, I want to predict this flow, but I want to also minimize the pollution over here, and I want to be sure that this tree is not affecting the traffic. But but that's not really the most uh, the most uh, reasonable approach. I think that the area that is giving us most return is uh, reinforcement learning. So there we are actually able to define a, a cost function, a reward uh, in a quite general way. And if our system, uh, our environment where the agent can interact in a dynamic way is general enough, we can come up with quite nuanced um, strategies where we are not only targeting uh, the preservation of this fish, but we have the whole ecosystem. And then the actions that we decide are a bit more general. No? So all these couple non-linear interactions can be taken into account. So I really think that uh, deep reinforcement learning already in fluid mechanics is giving us incredible results, incredible um, potential, and also in the context of optimizing uh, policy and basically deciding new directions uh, can actually be very, very promising. Mm. Thanks. We had another question from Mario Line Snipper. Uh, that was uh, basically about, um, you mentioned about um, inequalities that they, they can be uh, enhanced through different access um, to AI, for example. Um, but the question is actually, I think, the other way around. How can um, AI help for reducing inequalities and uh, for realizing a just and fair redistribution of the Earth's resources adapting? The principle yeah. of sharing. So, what, what are your ideas there? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I highlighted the challenges of AI in increasing inequalities. And there, to, to tackle that, you need to have proper regulation, proper frameworks, and uh, good monitoring and so on. But if you turn it around, I mean, I, I believe that uh, all these hidden connections and all this uh, access to massive data that AI can have is what can help us to have uh, more optimal solutions. I mean, uh, if we are able to feed um, all the information and we can have it's a very high dimensional optimization problem. No? And in that sense, AI can, can help. Of course, we need to be able to ensure interpretability. So this is done in a transparent way. And second, that the principles of fairness and the, let's say, the, the human values no, that we would have for redistribution of, um, of resources, uh, well, that it's basically present. No? And that there is a human in the loop that is able to, to supervise no, these, these decisions. I, again, I think there is potential uh, with all this high dimensional optimization, but one should not lose perspective that this uh, can lead to, to problems. No? So one should uh, try to do it in a proper way. Um, then we have a question from Adrian Gronach. Um, so the question is basically, is there any mapping of available AI solutions to the SDGs? Um, for example, flow analysis for uh, SDG 11 is, is a single example, but okay, you would love to see all such examples in one page. <laughs> I so don't know. I, the yeah. supplementary material of yeah. our paper is a list where all the examples are there. So for each target, you see all the papers that are connected with that target. So it's a massive list. Uh, and of course, this was published in 2020. So this is three years ago. So it's a bit outdated now. But still, I think it's reasonably, it's a good starting point if you want to then dig uh, deeper. So in that uh, file, that Excel file, for each of the SDGs, you have all the references, all the examples. So there, that's the most complete list. Yes, thanks. Okay, we have a lot of, lot of questions, uh, but we also have time. So um, 
I go on with the, the next one, uh, which is pretty general, but maybe you also want to comment on that. Um, so from Nika Messi Laurent, how can you predict future from past data? Well, that's a, good, that's a bit of a <laughs> philosophical question almost, no? Yeah. I mean, in the context of fluid mechanics, no? That's where I've showed my predictions. What I can do is that I can learn the temporal dynamics of my, of my system, and then I can make predictions uh, over time that follow the temporal dynamics that I have learned, no? And this works pretty well. Uh, of course, uh, fluid mechanics, like life, is, cha is chaotic, no? Uh, and at some point you diverge to a different trajectory. So you may not be able to have a perfect matching of each data point, uh, but at least you, you are learning the proper dynamics of the flow. Uh, if we try to generalize that to policy and, and social sciences, no, and, and, and to be able to predict what's going to happen, <laughs> what I would argue is that um, it is important to develop models that can help us to predict extreme events. That's a, and there's some research that is going in that direction, because of course, to predict the general trend of the, you know, a particular indicator, a particular, um, uh, you know, stock market, things like that, and you cannot really predict. But it's, I would argue that it's not so helpful anyway. What is really helpful is to predict extreme events. Um, so predict the emergence of the next pandemic or the really uh, tipping points in climate uh, change that, to predict those so that we can be prepared. And, and there is some research in that direction. So I think that that could help us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so then we have another more ethical question from Michael Buckhout. Um, so the question is, can the ethics of deep learning processes be reviewed on a long-term basis? If so, how could this be done? Sorry, which question is that? Which question? Yeah, because I'm also uh, trying to read it. Ah, okay, it's, it's basically uh, at 5.54. Can the uh, I, 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 for the moment, I skipped uh, ah. two that from the person that already asked another question, but we can have them <laughs> later. Okay, so so that was Michael back, back out, right? My, yeah. My, yes, exactly. Yeah, so the, yeah, of course, there's a lot of research of ethics of AI. It's a very, very active area of research. Uh, there's many people looking at it. Uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Virginia Dignum in Umeo, uh, is, is really a great expert on this. Uh, so I'm sure she can comment on, on this better than me. But uh, I believe that um, the principles of transparency and uh, interpretability are essential, no? to, to really, uh, because to, to, to manage to understand what the deep learning model is doing and to keep that, um, to be able to trace back how that particular decision was made, you need to be interpretable. And that's the first step towards accountability later on. If your model is not uh, interpretable, then it's very difficult to really uh, use it in a helpful way in any social application, no? because you're missing the accountability. So I would say that the first step towards AI ethics is actually AI, AI interpretability. And then from there on, uh, one can actually go into more, uh, more concise um, and concrete uh, ethical considerations. Thank you. Next one, you also see it, but I, I read for everyone. Uh, so Jakob Willem Bruin uh, was asking about um, developing countries uh, in the context that they are quickly adopting cellular technology in many domains, so basically skipping um, the traditional infrastructure, as we know. And uh, the question is if AI adoption will be will be similar in this. That's a good question. I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to tell, of course, but uh, what we advocate in, a, in the article is that it should be the case because um, for, to use, a, to use a, a large AI model, I mean, many of these models are already trained. So you don't really need a massive uh, HPC center to train the model. You just need to, to evaluate it. No? And the evaluation can be done on quite simple computers. Uh, but even for training large models, uh, you don't need a large perform a high performance computing center next to your house. I mean, you can access remotely the resources in Europe, in the US, uh, in Asia. So I think that the key here is uh, to increase the, the training in developing countries so people can access these large-scale infrastructures and develop their own models eh, in a quite uh, in a remote way because of course um, they're going to play a major a major role in the in the future lives eh? and in everybody else's of course oh next the next question is from Gustavo Camps 
uh, who really <laughs> liked this uh, nice summarizing uh, talk. Um, and he is commenting that the implications of using AI in the wild uh, should be taken into account um, and that um, trustworthiness and explainability uh, should really play a, a central role in that context. And the question is, maybe you know, would you react to this? Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo. Um, I'm happy that you like the, the presentation. So um, here I would like to differentiate explainability and interpretability. And it's a bit of a matter of notation. Uh, explainability is usually associated with, um, uh, with um, saliency maps, uh, Shapley values. Basically, what part of the input is more important for a particular prediction? That's what explainability typically is associated with. And in my view, that's not enough because uh, interpretability would be a, a more uh, strict requirement in which not only you know the parts of the input that are more important to the output, but you can actually have an equation, an equation or a set of equations that uh, represent the, the predictions of the neural network. So um, any, any uh, AI uh, system that is used for, for social good, for SDGs, for trying to tackle any social challenge, uh, needs to be interpretable. I mean, if you don't have interpretable systems, then any conversation about uh, trustworthiness and, um, and ethics is, is not completely, uh, completely impossible. So yes, and, in that, um, and the point is that now there are many methods that are starting to help us with the interpretability, uh, with uh, inductive biases, with different ways of symbolic regression, um, which are actually, Kramer has a very nice uh, article on that, so these symbolic um, uh, expressions are actually having a similar performance to that of the network while being interpretable. No? So I think that that's one of the directions that one should push. Yes, I actually had to, also something, on one of your slides, you basically had the AI and, um, and then basically uh, for, for designing better interventions, let's say, um, there was, I don't know, there was a little little arrow at, 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 at the bottom. And I was wondering, basically, you know, on the one hand, explainability is important, but also probably having causal models that really can, can model uh, interventions uh, in the right way and not just predict, basically, um, is probably important, right? I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Causality, causal methods, um, and being able to, to really have a, a proper um, a proper chain of events, not to really see not only the interactions among SDGs, but also how the different sequence of events will take place. Uh, and there again, reinforcement learning, I think, can be can be help, helping too. Okay. So the next question is is more uh, on this topic of uh, um, sustainability of AI or sustainable AI, and uh, um, it's from Julien Montan. Um, he uh, was uh, surprised by the uh, increase from 1% to 20% within 10 years regarding the ele electricity consumption. Uh, he's wondering for what this is. Is this for the whole um, ICT or only for specifics? And, and then the question is if AI is not more general, it's not sustainable per se intrinsically, because it needs data and therefore needs to store it also sustainably. That's maybe more philosophical, but maybe you want to comment on both. No, exactly. And th these numbers are for the whole ICT uh, sector. Uh, but of course, AI is a big, uh, well, it's a big uh, member no, of this, of this uh, chunk. So AI, as, as I mentioned before, um, the sustainability of AI is a challenge. Uh, AI is, is, is a tool. It can be sustainable or not. Um, what you shouldn't do is just build a larger model because you can. You have more data, you throw more data, and you large a bigger model, and then you have 0.01% better accuracy. That doesn't make any sense. No? So one should keep some perspective on the type of predictions that you want to make, on the type of uh, application, and then you should always embed uh, any knowledge that you have about the phenomenon that you're trying to um, represent in your model. If you know some physical uh, information, if you have some uh, behavioral information about that particular uh, system, it should be embedded in the model uh, because that will lead to a cheaper model computationally and environmentally and also uh, a much more uh, accurate model. Uh, embedding physics, um, transfer learning, as I mentioned before, you should not do retraining of stuff that is already trained in a different application. Uh, and, and these are uh, guidelines that are very important to raise also awareness of the environmental cost of training these very large uh, AI models. 
Thank you. Next question is more, more specific. Uh, the question if you can share any insights on how an AI, AI can contribute to SDG uh, 8. I think 8 is uh, about a uh, decent world and uh, economic role. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, generally the, the directions in the context of SDG 8 have to do with automatization, uh, more productivity, more effective matching of supply and demand, uh, things in that direction. That's uh, generally what SDG 8 can benefit from uh, in the context of AI. Thanks. And we have two questions from Sophie Buonar. Um, so first of all, she's asking, uh, what do you think are the key missing research areas in terms of AI and governments, governance? What sort of data do we lack? Yeah, and then I guess the... Yeah, okay, we can start with this. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, we, we lack uh, extensive data. Uh, especially in developing countries. We had, a, during COVID, we had a, a, an article in a Big Data and Society uh, where we uh, discussed how the lack of data and the lack of trustworthiness of the data really has uh, big impacts on, on policy, no? in that context of COVID policy, but, but generally no? in policy. Uh, so yes, uh, and, and also lack of open data for the public. The, the public should be able to also access these, these large databases uh, that are being used to decide policy to be able to, well, to be part of the process and to, and to add to the transparency. Uh, how can AI help in that uh, context? One direction is what I was mentioning before of um, finding hidden connections to SDGs and optimizing, no? and having some sort of optimization that can help us uh, to develop novel solutions. So that's um, one direction, but of course it's not a, well, it's not a very easy problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and, and the other question, uh, I think it's a response to the question on the, on the, on the prediction, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So it, um, her question is, uh, is it really best to predict something? <laughs> Uh, for example, impact or extreme events. I think that's what she uh, um, probably means. Um, yes. But is it rather better to have a set of solutions ready for the next probable, probable big issue? I think and both. How, how I mean, of course, uh, of course, both. Yeah. I mean, one needs to mm. aim at, uh, you know, already be prepared for the next pandemic. No, So it really use what we learned from COVID. Sometimes it seems that not so much, but that's another story. Uh, to build uh, the best solution for the next pandemic. But of course, we should also um, have uh, yeah, research on extreme events to be able to predict the emergence and the onset no, of the next uh, challenges. So I think both um, being able to predict them and also being able to prepare already solutions. Okay, so I think we have around, I think we need to um, not stop now, but rather we have four or five more, more questions, but I just would like to... Yeah. And now that we can not take take more, so um, you can save them as certainly for personal interaction, um, or maybe also the uh, conveners from AI for good will um, give comments, for example, in the neural network uh, where one could exchange further. But uh, so, but we have a couple of new more questions that can go until half past uh, six. Um, so there is one from Sahil Paris. Um, how can AI uh, solve SDG um, 13, so uh, climate action, and uh, the action, the question is particular related to certain aspects like plastic pollution, tree plant transplant, tree plantations, uh, which are human level tasks. Uh, okay, so how can technology help to solve this? Is a question. Yeah, I mean uh, at the end. Many of the examples, I mean, the examples that you mentioned, uh, even if they are uh, human level tasks, but uh, I mean, AI can help no? by identifying uh, regions of concentration of uh, plastic pollution, for example, by optimizing and trying to develop no novel uh, technology you know, to be able to, to tackle that. But if we go at other levels, I mean, for example, the matching of supply and demand of electricity uh, or the optimization of a particular uh, wind, um, wind park, you know, that we can actually, uh, with AI, have a more efficient operation that's actually helping us with climate. So uh, there's many, many areas where having the data, uh, AI can actually help us to develop better solutions for, for climate. 
um, also being able to being able to um, establish better climate models. This is an area that is becoming very uh, very hot uh, recently. Uh, because with better climate models, I can have better uh, predictions of the trends in the next years. And then hopefully I can predict more accurately various uh, scenarios uh, with different uh, levels of intervention. Thank you. So then um, one question from Maria Piles, who is also co-hosting this um, series, as you know. Uh, Sushi, thanks also for the very interesting talk and insight about making AI more sustainable. <laughs> and she uh, comments that, that the field of low resource AI is extremely important, uh, yet perhaps not attracting enough attention. So what are your takes on making AI more efficient and sustainable, actually shortly, so quickly? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the most straightforward approach is, uh, is what I was mentioning before, no? about uh, uh, being able to add, um, to embed physics and to embed uh, information that we know about the system, because that simplifies my model using transfer learning. Um, of course, having more efficient algorithms and supercomputers, but about the low resource um, AI, I mean, that's... That's, basically, that's the first thing that I tell my students in my machine learning course. And is that, uh, I mean, there are very classical methods that are much simpler, much uh, uh, computationally much less demanding, uh, which can actually do the job that they're looking for. So it's very typical that someone just gets a very big neural network and it starts TensorFlow and fits data and tries to get something out of it, try to understand the physics, try to understand what is actually happening. And there are many, many simple methods from linear algebra that are super cheap and that give you the performance that you need. So you should really start with the, simple, the simplest possible model that you need. And only if you can really benefit in terms of the additional performance, you should go for uh, more complicated and involved ones. And by the way, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, I, I think actually the uh, AI uh, um, consumption of energy is, is also really an economic uh, factor in the, in, the, in the big companies. And, and yeah. so, uh, at the end, uh, there's a lot of effort actually um, trying to do, for example, transfer learning, foundation models, uh, and so on, uh, and so on. So probably uh, it's, it's a at the end a political question that energy, uh, the energy cost needs to be internalized, uh, the external cost, so that they really reflect uh, what is the envi environmental effect. But we have two more. We have two more questions. So I take one from a little bit further up and connect it to another one. So they are both. Uh, they are two questions related to uh, SDG five uh, gender equality. So one is uh, if you know anything about AI for tracking education for girls in developing countries. I'm not sure if tracking is meant, meant or improving. Maybe also uh, what is working, what is not. So AI and education for uh, or, or gender equal <coughs> education. And the yeah. other one is, I think, is related, and uh, maybe quickly, it's also SDG 5, um, how, how AI is being used for this SDG 5. Uh, and then there's a specific question about eliminating violence against women and, and girls. Yes, yeah, so for education, there is quite some uh, research and so, quite some applications on uh, being able to track the performance of the students by evaluating well, the, the, not only their uh, answers to questions, but also uh, in a digital uh, in a digital device, uh, how, how much uh, they're focusing their attention on their eyes on particular regions of the screen to really identify if the students are following or not following certain areas or where they should get more reinforcement. Um, there is also quite some research on being able to use data to fine tune the curricula for individual students. And that also, uh, helps in the context of SDG5. <laughs> when it comes to violence, uh, there is also research on, um, for example, tracking uh, social media, social media posts, and by looking uh, just the public, uh, the, the wall, uh, by tracking the text and the images that are being posted, uh, there are AI algorithms that help to predict uh, when someone is in danger of depression, for example, or mental health problems, or also being, uh, yeah, like uh, asking for help, like violence against women and girls. Uh, there is work that is uh, through uh, apparently innocent messages in your social media, people might be actually asking for help, no? And, and that's uh, this algorithms and data that are helping in the context of that. 
Yeah, thank you. And we have one uh, last question uh, from Luz Rooney um, again also. So this is about um, the COVID uh, contact tracing apps. Um, they were mostly evaluated, I think, on your work from developed countries or industrialized countries. Um, so how uh, can AI be used to evaluate other apps used, uh, if any, also in developing countries? Uh, how about looking at that at a regional level as a preventive measure for our next global health challenge? Yeah, so in many of the aspects that we consider, especially with the governance, uh, they can be also applicable to, to developing countries. Uh, perhaps in the technology, some of the criteria could be adapted, but I think that is pretty much applicable also, no? because the principles of uh, uh, freedom, of not affecting the privacy and the rights, uh, they are applicable also in developing countries. However, one could yeah, develop them a bit more, the, the criteria, and of course, going into regional level uh, with the data availability of the particular regions, which is also quite different, uh, and to fine tune for the concrete applications, that may be a good idea, yeah. I agree. It's not a straightforward, but I think it's a, it's a very good point. Yes, yeah. so uh, <laughs> so. From my side, uh, and I think I, I speak for, for, for the audience, uh, by the way, we had more than 500 uh, registrations. Um, wow. um, so it's uh, was very nice to have this, this input uh, from, from you. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy if actually uh, Reinhard or Julian from ITU want to intervene and, and say a few words, basically, on, for example, the neural network. Um, what I can say is that uh, um, this series will um, continue uh, bi weekly. Um, so the next uh, will be on um, 14th or 15th, or oh, no, 15th of February, I think. Um, welcome to join this. And actually, every other week, uh, not starting exactly next week, but then, then later uh, we will have, um, uh, or not we, but uh, ITU will have a session uh, series. Um, organized by, by Philip Steers and Duncan Watson from, from Oxford, uh, specifically AI uh, for, for climate science, a series that already uh, started a year um, ago. So that's definitely also very uh, exciting to join. And together, these two series actually make, uh, I think, a nice program. Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Central European uh, time and accordingly in, in other time zones. And I think uh, the, the talks are also recorded so one can basically re hear them at any in any time zone when it's convenient for for you yes so from my side thanks a lot again Ricardo. thank you very much it was and, a pleasure um, and we stay in touch bye 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 Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool.
This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.